everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for this uh, webinar on Iceland. Uh, you can see up on your screen there that I also have Judy Hurst joining us for today. So um, before I introduce her, let me give you a couple of housekeeping items and I will introduce our portfolio to you. So my name's Jenan. I work for Emerging Destinations. We represent cool companies and cool places. Now you can see up on your screen, those are all of the all of the companies that we represent around the world. Uh, you also see my email address there and our website. So if you have any questions about any of those companies that you see up on your screen, I would be more than happy to answer those. You can reach out to me if you want any digital material or if you want to plan a private training for you and your team, I'm more than happy to help organize that. Um, of course, today we are talking about Iceland Pro Cruises and Iceland Pro Travel. So those are the two companies um, that we will be discussing and a new addition to our Iceland portfolio is Hotel Isla which you can see just to the left of the Pro Cruises logo so they are um, a hotel in Reykjavik that we have just just joined us uh, last month so we are very excited to have them as part of our team um, so a couple housekeeping items to go over before I hand things to Judy here. Uh, this webinar will be recorded, so if you do have to step away for any reason, maybe answer a call, etc., don't worry. Uh, I will be sending out the recording to everybody later this week. And at the end of the, um, the session as well, we will be doing a quick Q&A. So if you do have any questions for Judy throughout her presentation, you can type those over to her in uh, the using the GoToWebinar control panel located on your right-hand side. And we will we'll try to get Judy to answer as many of those as possible. But if there are a few that we don't get to, just, uh, just know we will be sending you the answer to those questions in our webinar follow-up as well. So please feel free to to type those through as we're going here. Um, and then lastly, I'll just introduce Judy to you. So Judy is, um, she's an Iceland specialist, in fact, and she has recently joined, she's working alongside Emerging Destinations uh, to promote Iceland Pro Travel and Pro Cruises. So Judy's from JDH Associates and she's come on board to help us with our Iceland portfolio. So she's a wealth of knowledge on the destination and we are actually going to be doing a four-part webinar series. So this is the very first one. Judy's broken the, the country down into four regions. So we are going to have three additional webinars uh, covering the rest of the country in the coming months. So please stay tuned for information about that. We definitely hope you can join us for those. But uh, without further ado, I'll hand everything over to Judy so she can uh, tell you about the first region that we have today. So over to you, Judy. Well, good morning, good afternoon. Hello, everyone. I am so glad that you joined me today and that I can share my passion for Iceland. I bet there are quite a few of you uh, who know me and get tired of me talking about Iceland all the time, but it is an absolute passion with me. And we're here today to introduce a bit of the country to you and Iceland Pro Travel. That's what I want you to know about. They are a terrific DMC company who can assist you with whatever services you need for your clients, be it self-drive itineraries, hotels, excursions, whatever you may need. Now, this as I was saying, this slide is a very important slide because we all know that entry uh, requirements and restrictions are very fluid and changing. So please make note of these two web addresses because this is where you will get all the information. And as a matter of fact, July 1, we've been advised there will be uh, some new changes. Hopefully they are going to be very good changes. Okay, it doesn't like. Here we go. Okay. As you can see, <laughs> Iceland constantly ranks high on the list of safest countries in the world to visit. And we did it again this year for the 12th year in a row. Probably the biggest question that I get asked is when can I see the Northern Lights? Iceland has a lot to offer, not just the Northern Lights, but that is a major attraction. Remember, they're elusive. There are no guarantees. And the season, however, is from September through early April. Iceland is a very small country. It's about the size of Kentucky, with only a population of 360,000 in the entire country. The majority of those people live in and around Reykjavik. Currency is the Icelandic krona. Right now, it's running about 121 krona to the US dollar. 
everyone speaks English. This is important. Tipping is not the custom. There are no taxes for tourists. The weather is another question that I get asked about as to what's the best time to go to Iceland. Here is a weather chart and also it's showing you the hours of daylight. Iceland is on the uh, Gulf Stream, so it's considered a moderate climate. It's ice, it's Greenland that's really frigid. Here you have the temperatures in Fahrenheit. The second line is the Fahrenheit, as well as the hours of daylight. You can see January, there's only about four hours of daylight, but when you get to the summer months, you can have almost 22 hours of daylight. If you don't like hot and humid summer weather, head to Iceland. On a good day in the summer, a really good day, we may hit 70 degrees. So it's a really great place to head if you don't want that heat and humidity. This is another important slide I wanted to show you of the electrical outlets. They have the round holes. So for most of your appliances, you're gonna just need what the upper left, you're just gonna need uh, the adapter. But check because some computers are not dual voltage and you may need to do a converter. But generally speaking, uh, the adapters, they run about $3 and you can get them almost anywhere these days. Really handy thing to have. Iceland is a nature lover's paradise. I don't know who counted, but they say there are over 10,000 waterfalls, geysers, glaciers, ice tunnels, ice caves. And oh yes, we do have an erupting volcano. I'm sure you've all heard about it. And Iceland Pro Travel can do volcano tours, both land-based as well as helicopter. Another iconic image of Iceland are the puffins. And again, I don't know, I guess the same person that counted the waterfalls counted the puffins. There are eight to 10 million puffins, they estimate. They mate for life, they live about 20 years. And the best time to view the puffins is the summer months, May to August. But my personal favorite, if I can, oh no, no, don't stop, here we go. This is absolutely my passion when it comes to Iceland are the Icelandic horses. They are short, stocky in stature, they're very docile and friendly creatures. And all over the countryside, you will see them. They do roam free. So make sure to arrange for a horseback experience. Speaking of experiences, they are everywhere. The map highlights quite a number of them. The average stay in Iceland, believe it or not, is only five days, but you can see that there are no shortage of things to see and do if you stay a little bit longer. With all of this to talk about, I didn't want to try to squish it into one 30-minute segment. So today we're going to talk about inside of the red lines, which is going to be Reykjavik and the surrounding areas, with the ultimate goal being down at the south. We're going to go along the south coast, and the ultimate destination today is going to be the town of Vik. Just a few facts about Reykjavik. As I mentioned, two thirds of the population live in Reykjavik. Many visitors actually base themselves in Reykjavik and do day excursions because as you can see in less than two hours, you can be inside a glacier, less than an hour inside a volcano. There's lots of nightlife, there's great restaurants, wonderful friendly people. Just a few slides to show you what Reykjavik looks like. Very colorful houses, beautiful sculptures, the gorgeous all glass concert hall called Harpa, and the Sun Voyager sculpture is also at the waterfront. While in Iceland is full of outdoor activities, there are tons of museums to visit. In fact, I think there are close to about 150, 170 museums of all different types. Some of them are very unusual. We can also get you a list of all of those. But wanting to learn more about the Viking culture and the history of Iceland, these two museums are excellent, the Saga Museum and the Viking Museum. To get a complete overview of the country, this is a brand new experience called Fly Over Iceland. And it's a very comfortable, easy way to see most of the island. And the experience, it's about a 35 minute film. So you're surrounded uh, like in a 360 degree screen. In case you go to Iceland and don't see the Northern Lights, 
you can go to the Aurora Museum. I thought it was going to be kind of hokey, but you know what? It was great. It was absolutely terrific. It's a virtual experience, and all the photographs that you see are taken by professional photographers. They are the real thing, and they are untouched. So you walk around looking at all of the northern lights, but you're inside in warmth and comfort. Another great thing is that if you're using a regular camera and you come here, they will actually set all of the, your camera with the proper settings so that your photos are going to look as great as theirs do definitely worth a visit. A little bit of Iceland trivia while we're at it. You know that the highest per capita consumption in the world of Coca-Cola is in Iceland. I think that's pretty amazing. And um, this is an ad from 1943. Another famous landmark of Reykjavik is the Lutheran Church in downtown Reykjavik. Now, Icelandic is not the easiest language in the world. And in 14 years of going back and forth to Iceland, I can honestly say I haven't even come close to mastering it. The word is something like Algrimskerka, church. So here is the church on the left. And then on the right, you can see its inspiration. Those are basalt columns that are found in the East Fjords in nature. And they capture that in the architecture of the church. Perlin Museum, another great place, especially if you have children, you want to take them with you. It is an interactive experience where you can learn about volcanoes and earthquakes and ice caves and northern lights and whales, etc. You can even walk through a recreated ice tunnel. There is a restaurant, there is a gift shop, and believe it or not, we're still in Reykjavik. Let's talk about food. This is the Icelandic hot dog. It is called pulsar. As you can see, uh, it's made from pork, beef, but a lot of lamb. Lamb is very, very popular. There are more sheep in Iceland than there are people, believe it or not. So lamb is very high on the menu. The Icelanders top them. This is what they call the everything with ketchup, mustard, romalad, onions. It's very, very popular. You can see this is the, um, the famous hot dog stand and everybody stands in line. Uh, they run about $4 per hot dog. And if you read a lot of the blogs and whatever on Facebook, you'll read where people say they are the best hot dogs and they stop at all of the gas stations around the country and they buy their hot dogs, quite reasonable. They run about $4. The other extreme, so if you don't want hot dogs, but you want gourmet cuisine, we, Iceland finally has a Michelin star restaurant. It's called Dill. It has reopened with limited hours, but it has reopened. The seafood in Iceland, as you can imagine, is absolutely fantastic. Remember, fruits and vegetables are all grown hydroponically without chemicals or pesticides. Look at these dishes. The one on the, I have to just mention, the one on the lower right is one of my absolute favorite things. That's ice cream. And it's something called rye bread ice cream. And I'm gonna talk about that a little further down the road uh, about the rye bread ice cream and how it's made. Here's something I bet you didn't know. There are over 60 golf courses in Iceland with an annual uh, tournament that anyone can sign up for. It's open to anyone. It takes place in June. And of course, tea time is midnight because we have the summer, uh, the midnight sun, and literally it is daylight at midnight. Mineral hot springs can be found all over the island and they are a must do experience. Perhaps the most famous one's the Blue Lagoon that you see here on the left. Um, a little bit on the touristic side, but it is a fabulous experience. The newest one is called the Sky Lagoon, and that's closer to Reykjavik. The Blue Lagoon is close to the airport, and the Sky Lagoon is close. It's about 25 minutes or so from downtown. It is man-made, but it is geothermal energy, so it is mineral hot springs. They both offer uh, food. 
Blue Lagoon, you can get massages and facial, different spa services. The Sky Lagoon has instituted something very different. It's a seven step ritual that includes hot showers, cold showers, um, all different things. And it, it's really bringing in the wellness factor that's steeped in Icelandic culture. You can do both, why not? If you're into fishing, you will just love going to Iceland. You've got fly fishing, you've got ice fishing and deep sea fishing. Remember I said there's tons to do and see in Iceland. Okay, let's start heading out of the city. And this is, on this map, it's showing you what is called the Golden Circle. And it's a route, it runs about 140 miles and it encompasses three of Iceland's most visited attractions. First stop we're gonna do is at Thingvillar National Park of Iceland. It's a World Heritage Site. It's roughly about 30 miles from the city, and it's the only place in the world where you can stand between two continental plates. The plates show a slowly shift about an inch a year, which changes the landscape and creates this extraordinary site. Another very unexpected experience located within the park is diving and snorkeling. Silfruff is a fissure between the two plates, between the North American and the Eurasian tectonic plates, and you can either dive or snorkel here. Silfra is said to have the cleanest water in the world. You can dive to a maximum depth of 60 feet. The average dive, however, is about 22, 30 feet. You can do it in a well, actually, they want you to do it in a dry suit because the water temperature is pretty darn cold. Okay, I'm having some temperamental issues here. Let's try this now. Here we go. Another really, really, really fun thing to do is to do this excursion which is called Into the Glacier. It's probably the only place in the world that you can do this. And it is, I just absolutely love it. This is about an hour or so um, from downtown Reykjavik, and you actually go inside the glacier, but only after you suit up and you get in the vehicle, which takes you to the entry to the tunnels. This was so much fun. And they've even created, in fact, I think it's the upper left photo, that they've created a chapel, which is now becoming very popular for wedding ceremonies. Along the way, you can stop and do some snowmobiling on the outside of the glacier. Okay, time to warm up. Let's go into a mineral hot spring. About an hour or so from Reykjavik is another popular thermal hot spring called Fontana. This is interesting. I think that swimming lessons in Iceland are mandatory for all primary school students as part of the country's policy to encourage public sports and healthy lifestyle. I think that's fantastic. In addition to the thermal waters here, so you're gonna go into the thermal, you can see there are different springs, there's different, they're all, um, temperature runs about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, but this, they do something also very interesting where they bake bread underground with, using the geothermal energy. It's like a, di a dark rye bread. You can have lunch here at their cafe and sample some of the dishes along, of course, with the rye bread. They're very big um, Scandinavian type open, open face sandwiches, which I think are, are just a great thing to do. For any of you bakers out there, I've even got the recipe for you. Of course, this is to bake in an oven though, not in the ground. But if you really wanna give it a try, it's really good. Notice the cooking time, five hours. Interesting, isn't it? Okay, we're gonna continue on southward, moving towards our destination of Vic. And here you see the majestic Golfas waterfall the golden waterfall. And this waterfall you view, you view from the top. It's an absolute feat of nature. Another slight diversion. 
another mineral hot spring. They're all over the island. There isn't a town that doesn't have a, a mineral hot spring. And this one is um, one of the oldest, actually it is the oldest swimming pool in Iceland. It's called the Secret Lagoon. You can see they're all a little bit different in style. This one is kept very natural and it's a, it's a place for people who wanna seek out peace and relaxation of mind and body. Really, really wonderful place to go. Ready for lunch? We're gonna go to the Friedheimer Tomato Farm and Restaurant. There are over 10,000 organically, hydroponically grown tomato plants here. And the menu features probably the best tomato soup you'll ever have. There's tomato ice cream, there's tomato bread, Bloody Marys, obviously a tomato centric menu. If you see the picture in the upper right, the gal, uh, there, what I love about this is there are basil plants on every table with a pair of scissors and you actually cut your fresh herbs to put into your tomato soup. Absolutely outstanding. The family also owns the stables next door. So the Friedheimer stables, you can now have another interactive opportunity to visit with the Icelandic horses case you didn't have your fill of waterfalls. Here's another one to gaze at. Absolutely spectacular. This is Haifas or Tall Falls. It's the fourth highest waterfall in Iceland. Now on to the geysers. Stoker, Stroker, sorry, it's the, Stroker is a fountain type geyser. And while there are lots of geysers in Iceland, this one is the most active and it sprouts not like our old faithful where you have to wait quite a while. This one sprouts every six to 10 minutes, shooting hot water about 100 feet in the air. Just wanna give you an idea of where we are now. We are heading towards Vik and we are now just approaching Selja Lundsfoss waterfall. Gosh, one is prettier than the next. I don't know how in the world you, you can pick your favorite waterfall. This one is really famous because this is one that you can stand behind. Extremely photogenic. But then again, I, I, I think the entire country is photogenic. But this is one that a lot of people really wanna to go to because you stand beside, behind the falls actually taking pictures. Now, you will get wet. And in case you haven't noticed, there are no guardrails at any of these falls. You can literally walk right up to the falls. The famous turf houses of Iceland. Due to the lack of trees in Iceland, turf was a, a popular and inexpensive building material. The thick walls work really well to ward off the cold winter weather. And here you can visit the Skogar Museum Village and take a step back in time. There are six historical buildings, three museums, and about 15,000 regional artifacts. It's fascinating. You can go inside, so you'll be able to see the inside of them as well. Okay, we still have more waterfalls, believe it or not. This is Skogafoss, one of Iceland's largest waterfalls. It's 200 feet high with a drop of 80 feet. And the unique thing about this waterfall is that you can climb 370 steps to get a view from the top. This shows you a really good comparison to the size of the people in relation to the size of the waterfall. And you see the steps and the trail going up to the right. This will give you a little bit of a workout. And here we are. We've reached our destination, the charming town of Vik and its black sand beaches. These rock formations are spectacular. Icelandic people are very superstitious. They believe in legends, they believe in trolls. And it seems that according to folklore, these pillars were actually trolls. And while dragging home a three-masted ship towards the land, the trolls were taking too long to reach the shore. So at the break of dawn, they were frozen and turned into stone. It's a beautiful, beautiful spot. You can't take a bad picture in Iceland. You really, you really can't. It's just insanely beautiful. 
While here in the area of Vic, take time to visit the Lava Center. It's a high-tech exhibition of volcanoes and earthquakes. In case you weren't able to hike to the volcano, the erupting one closer to Reykjavik, in this museum you can actually experience flowing lava and you can feel the heat of the lava. So by now, uh, you've seen an awful lot of Iceland, even though we've only done a quarter of the island. By looking at the multitudes of, of the natural wonders and the landscapes, you can understand why Iceland is a popular destination for movies and TV programs. Game of Thrones definitely uh, used a lot of locations here, and we can also arrange for Game of Thrones tours. So if that was a program you were really into, let us know when we can arrange a tour for you. If you prefer cruising, our sister company, Iceland Pro Cruises, offers seasonal sailings around the island, and some of them also include Greenland. So this is a very nice, relaxing way, and you will stop at 10 different ports of call doing a complete circumnavigation of the island. So I hope that you've enjoyed our presentation. I've tried to condense a lot of things into a 30-minute session. Uh, actually, I did it in 25, so that's pretty good. There's a lot more to see and do, and that's why I'm going to do three more presentations, each one focusing on a different part of the island. Um, what we've done here, if you were to go, we, we've done a half of the southern coastline. The next one is going to take us from Vic, where those black rock pillars were. We're going to continue along the south coast with the destination of the city of Hoffen, H-O-F-N, and that's about 175 miles further heading eastward. So I do hope that you will join me for that because I've got so much more to tell you about Iceland. Keep in mind also that if you want any presentations for your clients, for your staff, just for yourself, please let us know. We can uh, create, you know, specific ones, uh, theme focused. If you want something on just food or sports or adrenaline or whatever you might want, we can certainly arrange that for you. So I hope that you found this worthy of your time, maybe learn some new things about Iceland. And I look forward to seeing you for our next one, which will be sometime in July. And I think Jenna is about ready to join us and see if we have some questions. I am. I'm here now, Judy. Thank you so much for that great presentation. We have a ton of questions coming in. So as I said, <laughs> yeah, well, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, but that was that was a great presentation, Judy. I feel like even I learned some things um, about Iceland that I didn't know. So that's great to hear. Like for the Coca-Cola, why do you think it is that they that they drink so much Coca-Cola in Iceland? Well, from what I've read. It, because it's bottled in, or, or I guess bottled is the right word, canned, whatever, in Iceland, and they use Icelandic water, which is oh. really clear and fresh. It has a little bit of a fresher taste, and it just seems that that's what people, are, they're just obsessed with it. They absolutely love it. Mind you, they drink other things as well, not just Coca-Cola, right. but absolutely. It's just a, a, a real iconic drink there in Iceland. Interesting. So um, as I mentioned, we'll try to get to as many of these questions as possible. Um, the first one I'm going to start with, Judy, is because I was also curious about this. You had said something about the rye bread ice cream and that you were going to tell us oh, more about yes. it later. Oh, yeah. oh okay. I, I'm an ice cream freak. So when you looked at that picture of the ice cream, what they do is they take that rye bread that they bake in the ground. Not all, granted, not all of it is baked in the ground. I mean, people do make it in their homes, but it's a very dense, thick, heavy, dark, molasses-y molasses -y type tasting rye bread. And what they do is they let it dry out and they make it into what would we would think of like breadcrumbs. They take the ice cream base and they fold those crumbs into the base to give the ice cream texture and flavor. And a lot of the restaurants in Iceland, I, oh, ice cream is huge, huge in Iceland. There are tons of ice cream places. But I just found that this ice cream, this rye bread ice cream was out of this world. 
I never got to try it when I was there. So I'm definitely oh, adding that to, to my back. list. <laughs> I know. Oh, definitely. Absolutely. There's a lot that I didn't, I haven't seen yet in Iceland. I, I have a lot, a lot of trips back still. Um, so uh, another question here for you, Judy, are there ever any sunny days in Iceland? Absolutely. Um, I've been, uh, going to Iceland for the past 14 years and I've been in every season and um, I don't have a favorite season if anybody wants to know that I don't because basically you can do almost every activity any time of the year but um, I, I, I just think it's just a fabulous destination no matter what and I found that there were lots of sunny days especially the summer months you do have more sun in the summer than in the winter months, it's gonna be a little overcast. That, that's the word that I would use. It's gonna feel more overcast. Maybe you'll get two or three hours in the middle of the day where the sun comes out, but it won't be bright sunshine too much in the winter. And another question here for you. So, I mean, answer this one as best you can, because I know you went over a lot of different sites that you can kind of, oh, you can yeah. see within, Within that one region, so there's obviously a lot, a lot more that you still have to cover. But a, of the ones you covered today, how many of those are possible to do just on a day tour from Reykjavik, for example? That, that's a really good question. A lot of them can be done on a day tour, not going as far as Vic, because that that that's that would. I mean, if you went straight, if, if you just left Reykjavik and didn't stop anywhere along the way and you went to Vic, that alone would take you about three hours or so. The roads are good, but they're only two lane highways. So you may encounter weather, you may encounter traffic. Um, keep in mind the signs are written in Icelandic. <laughs> good luck with that. Um, what I would say that the Golden Circle the, where we started out when we left Reykjavik, that encompasses a lot of what people want to see. They can all be done on day trips, um, but not Vic. Vic is too far. Where where we ended up is too far. But honestly, most of those could be done on a day trip. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to mention right now, in case anybody has to leave, this will be recorded and we will be sending the recording out to you. So if you do have to sneak away now, um, don't worry, you'll get to, you can catch up on the rest that you might miss. And we do have a lot of questions. So I'm just going to say right now that we will not be able to get to all of them. So if we don't answer your question right now live, just know that uh, we will answer those in the webinar follow up. Excellent. So the next one for you, Judy, uh, which is the least crowded lagoon? And I, of the ones that I mentioned, keep in mind that this is Icelandic culture. These geothermal mineral hot spring baths are everywhere. Every town has a mineral hot spring it's they call it a swimming pool but it's also part of their social life this is where people go to socialize and to meet if you want something touristic you're going to go to the blue lagoon and you should go to the blue lagoon it, i mean to come home from iceland and people say did you get to the blue lagoon how could you say no but it is more of the touristic the secret lagoon would be i would say of the ones we talked about would be the most natural setting and it isn't typically very crowded so i i would lean towards the secret lagoon have you been the you mentioned a new lagoon um on there um i know it's it's quite new have you visited that site yet the sky lagoon just sky lagoon. a month ago so okay. I, not having been to iceland in a while thanks to COVID, the answer is no. But I will tell you, there are some really great bloggers or influencers, whatever the word may be, that have posted on YouTube, not just the Sky Lagoon, but also the volcano. There's lots and lots of videos out there that you can see. And there was one that was really good that I watched of the Sky Lagoon. It's, it's a Icelandic cultural thing with seven steps. And it, 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 I can't even begin to explain it. I watched the uh, YouTube. I'm looking forward to it definitely on my list when I go back to Iceland, definitely. 
perfect. Well, hopefully we can uh, do a webinar with you after that trip, whenever that may be. Oh, we yeah. Catch up on all the new things that you've figured out or new I'm things that have opened. <laughs> I am yeah. really looking forward to it. Um, so just for time, let's just take one more question here. And then again, you can continue to type them through. Uh, we will, I know we've had a lot of people ask about some of the maps um, and the presentation of yours as well, Judy. So we can, we can share uh, that information with you as well um, to cover the last question. So again, this is going to be a tough one, Judy. So we'll, we'll end it up, leave off with this, but is it possible to cover all the iconic points of the country in one trip? And if so, how long should it be? If you were to go for 10 days and didn't stop too long at any one place, the answer would be yes, which is why your other option would be Iceland Pro Cruises which right. will give you a sailing and circumnavigate and take you completely around the island. There are no roads, so to speak, that go up the center. You have to go around the circumference of the island and the road follows the topography. So it's not a straight 60 mile an hour highway. And there are lots of places to stop. And as you can see, I mean, every time you turn around, there's another photograph waiting to be taken, no matter what time of the year you're there. Wait, oh God, wait till we get up to the north. Oh my God, I love the south, but I am insanely crazy about the northern part of Iceland. I would, I would hate for you to go and try to squeeze it all in in one short trip of five to seven days. You, you'll miss a lot. Yeah, I was going to mention that if if people do want to see all the iconic spots, um, that the Pro Cruises is great because we do have um, a couple different durations of the circumnavigation. And you, as Judy mentioned, you're getting to these further out uh, little communities and towns that you won't necessarily get to on if you're just doing the ring road. So it's it's another great option for exploring Iceland, but we can cover more of that um, in a future webinar. So I think for today, let's uh, leave it at that, Judy. I know um, we can we can answer all of these other questions and send them out. So uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And Judy, thank you so much. We've had a ton of really great uh, feedback and thanking you for how informative of a presentation it was. So thank you great. so much for your time and looking forward to our future webinars to finish off the company. See you all next time. Thank you again for spending your time with me. Thank you.